The Ketchup. The Ketchup. The Ketchup. Monday morning. Ketchup. Thank you guys. Welcome to Monday Morning Ketchup, a new series here with our CBC Teams podcast where we catch you up with messages from Sunday. These are extremely abbreviated notes as we encourage you to meditate and think about what was preached. We also encourage you to catch up with Brother Ron Van Kirk in a new series entitled Ron Like the Wind. More on that in just a moment. Mark 13.4 was the site of our 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, service where the Bible reads, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled. The Bible says that the disciples reached out to uh, the Lord during the Olivet Discourse and asked him, well, what, what does the end time look like? Because, you know, they're wondering, you know, when is the restoration of Israel, you know, and all these things kind of unfolding. And so, uh, Pastor Pete mentioned this is the 48th message in the Gospel of Mark series here, and uh, just providentially, the Lord had had uh, landed us in this particular uh, order, considering our world, certainly an interesting message for sure. By a point of introduction, Pastor Pete mentioned two things to us, that we need to strengthen ourselves with our relationship and commitment to our God, and also strengthen ourselves in our commitment to sharing the gospel in these last of the last days. There's worldwide warnings, there's a worldwide deception, there's worldwide division, and worldwide disaster, all found in verses 5 through 8. The Bible also tells us in verse 13 that the faithful will be hated, that the faithful will be arrested, found in verse 9 and 11. Faithful will suffer physical pain, verse 9. Uh, all these things are sad and they sound dark to us, but a word of encouragement that this type of pressure puts uh, God's people in a good spot because it increases our faith. It increases our faith in God. It doesn't feel good, for sure, uh, but at the other side of it, we realize that we have grown closer to our Lord and our Savior. And so, uh, we need not uh, fear. Our Lord is in control of all these things. And so we look to God uh, for the healing of our world. The uh, 9.30 service, I had the honor of preaching at, uh, at the 9.30 service. And the message was a little bit for an older crowd uh, towards younger families. Not necessarily a teen style message, but if you're a teen out there, you can kind of put these away and think about maybe what kind of parent that you'll be someday. And the message was entitled, To Measure a Parent's Success out of Proverbs 4, 1 through 4, where the Bible said, Here, this is Proverbs 4, 1 through 4, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, for seek ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved of the side of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. So, we talked about how Solomon outlines what successful parenting looks like. And number one, a willingness to command children is found in those verses. Number two, by connection to good doctrine. Number three, by instilling uh, joyful memories in the child despite your own faults. If you notice in that particular uh, few verses, Solomon is referencing something that David said to him. He's speaking in first person. He's, then he refers to his father and some of the advice that he gave him. And, you know, you talk about who's David's wife and who's Solomon's mom is Bathsheba. Albeit their faults, they still had the ability to create a good home for their child, Solomon. And you know, what was really interesting is that Solomon was still willing to implement what they taught him. And so, um, what the greatest blessing of all was found in 2 Samuel 7, 13 and 15, is that when David wants to build the temple, he so wants to build it for the Lord, but God tells him, you know what, you know, you, you're not gonna be able to do it, you've been in war, and so, but your son's gonna do it, and Solomon, or excuse me, God tells David that he would be a father to Solomon. He'd be a father. And so for us, you, know, you and I, the greatest thing we could do someday, uh, as we get married, God, God leads that into your life, is to tell people about the great father, who is Jesus Christ himself. And that's the greatest thing, really the mark of a successful parent. We must replace ourselves in this life. And so we must do that in the lives of our children someday. Obviously, a little bit older message, but, you know, tuck that away for when you are a parent. And now for an exciting segment entitled, Ron Like the Wind. And welcome to Ron Like the Wind, the barely edited Monday morning drive to bank to the bank to drop off the Sunday offering. Along the way, we will drive with, we will interview, let me start that again. Welcome to Ron Like the Wind, the barely edited Monday morning drive to the bank to drop off the offering. Along the way, we will interview Brother Ron, I actually can believe it's not butter, Van Kirk, for his unique perspective on politics, business, and nonsense. Brother Ron, how are you today? I'm good. Wonderful. I'm safe. I'm happy. It's a beautiful day. 
It is a Can't beautiful thing. Can't complain? Oh, oh, boy. boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. And I think we're okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, not a huge uh, news day, Brother Rod. No. Boring. Everyone slow. Just kinda, yeah, slow. Yeah, just slow. The dog days of summer here, the hey, first day of June. <laughs> what can you do? Everything's just slow. Low key. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, we're, you know, a lot of things in our minds and in our hearts. And so, uh, a lot of times these things kind of beckon for uh, a philosophical question. What is the purpose of government? The purpose of government is very simple. It is to reward good and punish evil. That's the purpose of government. So, outside of that, they really serve no purpose. That's what they're supposed to do. Well, let me ask you about rewarding good. Can you define that a little bit more? Is that more like leave you alone? Is it more like... Sure. Yeah, when I say reward good, their their job is to essentially protect those that are doing good mm-hmm. and punishing those that are doing evil. And they kind of go hand in hand. If you're... In order to protect those that are doing good, you're going to punish those that are doing evil. Mm-hmm. And so, really, that's, that's, the, that's the purpose of government. That's what the founders intended, and that's what it's there for. Can you explain what is meant by the phrase limited government? Sure. The, you know, in, in, in the Christian's life, we would say that the Bible is infallible and that whatever is spoken in the Bible is literally gospel truth. Well, when it comes to the, the Constitution, although it's certainly not you know, infallible because it's written by man, but America is a land of laws, and the Constitution is essentially the Bible of the government. If it's not spelled out in the Constitution, you will hear it often said it's unconstitutional. So the Constitution is the document that provides for our government. And the Constitution is a list of things the government cannot do. That's what it's there for. And uh, when you say limited government, what that means is a government that is run by the Constitution. Anything that's outside of those boundaries is said to be um, you know, growing government or enlarged government. So limited government is basically saying what the founders intended, and um, that's what uh, the term limited government means today. Well, that concludes part one of the Monday morning catch-up. Please continue to part two. So, I mean, you mentioned the Constitution, which ultimately would be the last layer of authority mm-hmm. in our country. So, kind of another philosophical question, what is holding up the Constitution? Is it the government itself? Is it us as individual citizens? You tell me. Well, what it's supposed to be and what it actually is, unfortunately, are two different things. You know, you've heard it. People like to throw around the phrase, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people, or to quote Vice President Biden, you know, you know the thing. But, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people means that no law, no man is above the law. So any law that's written is written of the people. It's the purpose of it is to govern, to be governed by the people, and it's for all people. And so whenever you talk about um, who upholds the Constitution, it's the it's the people's responsibility. Uh, after the founders wrote the Constitution, one of them, and I, always, I think it was Thomas Jefferson, was asked after the Constitution was written, what have you, sir? And he said, we have a republic if you can keep it. And so the founders knew all along that it wasn't going to be any government entity that upholds the Constitution. It's going to be the people. And um, all of the amendments, all of the articles in the Constitution were meant to be upheld by the people. The problem that we have today is that people simply don't know what the Constitution says. Um, You know, we throw around, that's unconstitutional. But if you ask someone why it's unconstitutional, most of the time they have no idea why. And so how can you uphold and defend a document that you don't know what it says? There's a lot of parallels with Scripture. How can you uphold and defend what you believe as Christians if you don't know what Scripture says about it? And um, when it comes to the Constitution, if people don't know it, if they don't study it, if they don't understand what it actually means and what it actually says, there's no way they can uphold it. So consequently, we've kind of forfeited that responsibility over to the government, which is kind of ironic because the whole purpose of the Constitution was to protect against a large government. But... What it's supposed to do and what it actually is, unfortunately, in many cases, is not the same. Hmm. Well, uh, so there's a burden of us, or a burden on us as citizens to know what it says. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it'd be interesting to ask how many, if they even knew, if someone could name, you know, five of the, the ten Bill of Rights, um, you know, you might get the same look as if you asked someone to name five of the ten Ten Commandments, <laughs> um, you know, from the average person. And 
if you don't know them, you certainly can't protect them. You know, we, we like to talk about the first one. Of course, we're seeing, you know, freedom of speech, you know, freedom of press, right to assemble, um, freedom of religion. And the second one, of course, you know, with guns. But most people don't even understand what the whole purpose of the Second Amendment was, uh, much less, you know, how to uphold it. In 3 through 10, forget about it. And then there actually are 25 amendments, and I'm going to say that there's probably not one in 100 that can name 11 through 25. So uh, people just, it is not a real lengthy document. It's actually very short, uh, but people just haven't studied it and haven't, haven't um, taken the time to, to read it and really understand what it means. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, Second Amendment more important, less important than the rest of them? No. There's, in my opinion, there's no one amendment that's any more important than others. Now there's times in history when um, certain amendments become more spotlighted. Uh, and of course, right now, the Second Amendment is that, um, it, in light of what's going on in our world today, um, you know, there's guns being sold literally by the hundreds of thousands more really than any time in history because people are fearful, ironically, that the government's going to take away or try to take away their Second Amendment rights. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't say there's anyone that's more important than the any other. I just think at different times they've been highlighted. You know, think of the Fourth Amendment, which, you know, um, is your private property amendment when... You know, people start talking about, you know, what's theirs. And, you know, you see that right now where you have these looters that are just, you know, destroying and taking that's not stuff that's not theirs. Well, those those business owners are protected by the Fourth Amendment. They have a right to their private property and they have a right to defend it, which ties in with the Second Amendment. So um, they really go hand in hand. Uh, they're all there for a specific purpose, and a spe specific reason. But if we don't know what they are, it's really kind of hard to defend them. Yeah, they, they all work together. Yes. And we kind of alluded to it at the beginning but strange times for sure for sure it is it's it's actually it's i think you just said a second ago before the cameras on it's sad yeah. um what's going on i mean you take a look around at these these businesses many of them that have been decimated by the this this covid shutdown in fact we're driving past one right now that was just closed because of covid now these uh, these businesses that have just been open for a week or so we're having to close again because of these these looters it's just it's sad it's a sad day in our country and um, it's it's unfortunate. I hope that the powers that be can get things under control because after all their job is to reward good and punish evil and there's a lot of evil going on right now and unfortunately it's um, being let go and um, I'm certainly not going to sit here and be an armchair quarterback but um, something has to give at some point. It's either the anarchists win or the law wins and my prayer is that law wins. Mm. Do you have any advice for uh, folks listening in? Obviously lots of questions, lots of feeling. Uh, you know, lots of passion kind of going around, but any advice to people that are just kind of absorbing these events? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't trust a lot of the news coverage on any of these events. I mean, as we've seen before, I mean, they can be so disingenuous. I mean, you turn on one station and they're they're praising what's going on. You turn another station on and they're the worst people in the world. Um, the whole purpose of the news business today is just that it's business. Mm -hmm. It's to get eyeballs on your their screen, and so they will... Clicks. Yeah, clicks on the online, you know, eyeballs on the on you know on the television. So they'll say whatever they essentially want their viewers to, what they think they want their viewers to hear. Um, I would just encourage people that you should never make decisions when you're emotional. Um, emotional decisions are almost always bad decisions. And so, you know, everyone has strong opinions on these things. I would just encourage people to, to think calmly and rationally. Of course, you know, pray for the wisdom of our leadership. You know, and uh, to pray that they make the right decisions, and um, and don't get caught up in a lot of the he said she said stuff that seems to be so prevalent in news today. Of course, we pray for those who were hurt too. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, that, that, that's sure. probably the one of the, the biggest the thing. biggest tragedies of all this is, you know, that uh, Mr. Floyd that was killed by that police officer was horrible, and that police officer is probably going to go to jail for the rest of his life, and he deserves that, if that's what the evidence um, says, but. You know, we have something in this country called due process, which ironically is guaranteed by the Constitution. And that due process is being played out. He's been arrested. Um, charges have been pending. And so his, his day will come. Uh, but, you know, looting a target or destroying a, a mom and pop restaurant over the loss of a life of someone is just, it just exacerbates the problem. And it doesn't even make any sense. And, um, but that's where we are right now. Mm. Well, uh, in lighter news, uh we are reopening the nursery ministry. Yes. Hallelujah. Also known as the nursery economy. Yes, exactly. At the Cleveland Baptist <laughs> Church. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the question is, uh, 
not how do you reopen the nursery, the nursery economy. I don't think that's the question. I think how do we prepare our children to not declare mutiny on the one of, one of the best we've got, Mrs. Deborah Green. Oh, I know. I God bless her for what she God does bless her, and yes. what um, all the rest of those nursery workers do. I don't know. It sh- it should be interesting. I was really nervous on on Saturday, you know, for the kindergarten graduation. I was talking to Mrs. Hoffman and these kids have not been in a structured school setting, you know, right. since March 17th or 16th or yes. something like that. So it had been well over two months. And I just know, speaking for my son, I'm like, you know, what's it going to be like? They did great. They it did it really, really was. Well. Yeah, it was a did. great program they and they did really well. So um, I was ready for the nursery to be open the second we set foot back on the campus of Cleveland Baptist for the first time since this whole thing started. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it should be interesting. We'll see. Well, I mean, yeah. we're. I'm looking forward to being able to put Judah back in the nursery and um, being able to actually listen to a message without having to hear car noises. And message? What are you talking about? Messages? What do you yeah, mean? Uh, yeah, exactly. I don't even know if there was, was even <laughs> preaching going on yesterday morning at 9:30. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> so, but no, I, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, we, you know, we've t- taken precautions. You know, we have a lot of medical professionals that work in our church in the nurseries, and um, you know, they'll be safe to open back up. And I, I'm very grateful for them. They do a wonderful job and. Um, I know Tanner, even to this day, still goes back and um, talks to some of his, you know, older nursery teachers that he remembers, and um, it's going to be it's going to be a welcome uh, addition to mm-hmm. to the services seeing that opened up again. So very grateful for that for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, brother Rod, appreciate your take today. Certainly appreciate the the insight, my friend. My pleasure. Everyone, stay safe. All right. God bless. Sunday evening's message was entitled "Concerning Me" out of First Corinthians eight. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says this. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So, in similar to our church theme, Grace and Truth, there's an interesting balance that takes place between knowledge and charity that uh, Pastor Pete unpacked uh, on Sunday night. Wonderful message. There are two considerations. What I know and the impact of my choices on believers. Pastor Pete pointed this out, that knowledge builds me up while charity builds other people up. Then he pointed out there's two kinds of Christians. There are strong Christians and weak Christians, and how those two engage in each other in a local church setting uh, really would create the culture of that church. There are two conclusions from this message. is that depending on the issue that is debated upon, you know, in the church or whatever the case may be, that I may have uh, Christian liberty in that area, so I could choose two things. I could either pursue, proceed, proceed, prosciutto. I could either proceed with my own Christian liberty, or I can suspend my own rights for the good of others. And you and I have the gift and honor to decide that when we proceed in our own Christian life at our local churches. So certainly appreciated those messages, and uh, appreciate uh, the spirit that Pastor Pete preached that in. Well, that's all the time that we have for the Monday morning catch up. We'll catch you next week. And uh, we're still working through some tech issues. Thank you for your patience in that. God bless you, my friend, and stay in the Word. Catch up!